everybody a very Merry Christmas to every single one of you. We are kicking off our brand new Christmas series today called Comfort and Joy. Have you noticed that we have just so many things in our day and age that can keep us worried and rob us of our comfort and joy? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about mass shootings. I'm talking about terrorist attacks. I'm talking about impeachment proceedings. I'm talking about all the different things we can face, human trafficking, recessions. There are so many things. Honestly, if you think about it, the list is endless with all the things that can rob us of our comfort and joy. So what we want to be doing in this series, what we want to do is we want to discover how is it that we find comfort and joy despite the circumstances that we face. How do we find comfort and joy during Christmas time when you have lost a loved one? How do we find comfort and joy during Christmas time when you don't have the money to buy the presents for people that you love? I mean, how is it that we find comfort and joy when some of us find it difficult to breathe as we are crushed under the weight of our circumstances? That's what we want to talk about in this series. And I want to start off today by asking you a question, and that is this question right here. Do you believe God speaks to you? Do you believe God speaks to you? Do you believe that God tells you when you're about to do something wrong? Do you believe that God shows up at a time of need in your life and that he guides you and directs you? Do you believe that God has a will for your life and that he tries to communicate that to you? Do you believe God speaks to you? Or do you more believe that God only speaks to certain people, certain godly people like people from the Bible? But not me. God would never speak to somebody like me. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe that even though I am an imperfect, sinful human being who has let God down so many times, I have lost track. I believe that even though that's who I am, God still speaks to me. And not only do I believe that God speaks to me, but I believe that God speaks to you. Not only do I believe that God speaks to you, but I believe that God wants to speak to you today. That as busy as God is and as much as God has to do, he cares about you enough and loves you enough to speak into your life today. And so I pray that the presence of God would fill your life as you sit in your seat. I pray that God would move in your life. I pray that God would bother you today in such a way that you would have no choice but to surrender yourself to the will of God today. I pray that this message haunts you, that it bothers you, and that you are not able to forget it for a very, very long time. About six years ago, uh, Christmas Eve 2013, I'll never forget that day. Uh, it was Christmas Eve 2013. I was on staff at Vantage Point as a pastor, and we had just finished our fifth Christmas Eve service. And it was the first time we had done five, and I remember leaving that night, and I just felt on fire for God. I mean, I just felt so privileged to be a pastor. I remember feeling on cloud nine, driving home, and I felt kind of hungry, so I pulled into McDonald's because it was like the only thing open on Christmas Eve. It was about 8 o'clock at night, and uh, I pulled into this McDonald's. I, I rolled down my window, and I felt this gust of wind. It was cold, and I was like, whoa. Placed my order, went to the window, got my food, rolled up the window as quickly as I could. And as I'm driving out of the drive through exit, I look over, and I see this homeless man digging in a trash can. Now, Nine times out of ten, I would have just kept on driving. Truth be told, if I'm being honest with you, in fact, I would say 99 times out of 100, I would have looked over and thought, that sucks, and just kept on driving. But something was different that night. And the best way I can describe it to you is, is it was like God grabbed a hold of my heart and he said, stop. And so I stopped. And I don't mean like I paused mentally. I mean I literally stopped my car. 
And I felt like God very clearly said to me, give him all the money that's in your pocket. And I started panicking because I did not know how much money that I had in my pocket. And so I reached in and I pulled out a $20 bill. Now, $20 probably is not a lot of money to you, but me back then in 2013 as a young youth pastor with two children, that was a lot of money to me. In fact, that $20 was supposed to last me for food and gas until I got paid again in January. So I put it back in my pocket. And I remember this war started raging in my mind. And part of me was like, hey, hey, you got you to gotta do what God said. And part of me was like, hey, man, this could be the devil trying to give drugs to that homeless man. And, I mean, it just started going. You know how it is. You've been there. And I'll never forget, I, I didn't feel at peace. I didn't feel like I knew what I was supposed to do. But I, I'll never forget, I just prayed this prayer. And I said, God, I trust you. And I rolled down my window. And I said, hey. And he, he didn't turn around. So I said again, I said, Hey. And he turns around and I said, I got something for you. And it was right about that moment that I started feeling like I was doing something illegal, you know. It felt like kind of like a drug deal was going on. I'm like, hey, I got something for you, man, you know. But he comes over to the car and I reached out and I gave him like this folded bill. And he opens it up and he starts going nuts. He's like, woo, woo. And at first I was scared. I was like, oh my, you know, like I didn't know what he was going to do. And I was like, okay, he's excited. And then I started worrying, like, I'm like, did I just buy him some really good meth? Or is he just praising God for meeting his needs? I didn't know, but I chose to believe the second. And I calmed him down. I said, hey, hey, I want to I wanna, I wanna say something. And, and so he quieted down. He had this big smile on his face. And I said, hey, I, I, just, I just wanted you to know that God put it on my heart to give that to you. Because I believe he wanted you to know that he loves you and you're not forgotten. And all of a sudden, his face got real serious, and he looked down at the bill, and he looked up, and he said, thank you, and he walked away. And a couple weeks later, I got a phone call that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Someone from this church called me and said that God put it on their heart to write a check for my family for $20,000 to help us buy a house. We had been looking for a house since 2011. At this point, it was 2014, so for three years, we looked to buy a house. We could not afford to buy a house within 10 miles of Esau. We wanted to move closer to you, our church family, but we couldn't afford it. And God moved in this person's heart to help us and give us $20,000 to put down on the house. And I want you to think about this. I gave away $20 in obedience to God. And God gave me back... $20,000 by moving in the heart of someone else to be obedient to him. And in case you're wondering, that's an increase of 1,000 times what I gave away. And I just think that it's sad how often you and I are afraid of what our obedience to God might lead to. Here I was afraid, what if God won't meet my needs for giving away $20? And then God gave me back a thousand times what I gave away. I met someone else's needs, and then God met my needs through someone else. And if you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down. You have no idea what God can set into motion through one single act of obedience. Listen to me. You have No idea what God can set into motion through one single act of obedience. Noah once built an ark in obedience to God, and God saved the entire human race through Noah and his family. A teenage shepherd boy once went to deliver some cheese to his brothers who were fighting a war out of obedience to his father, and he faced a giant and forever changed the fate of an entire nation. 2,000 years ago, some ordinary fishermen named Peter, Andrew, James, and John forever changed this world when they dropped their nets, left their jobs, in obedience to Christ. Listen, you have no idea 
what God can set into motion through one single act of obedience. If you have your Bibles, would you open them with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, it's about in the middle of your Bibles. Um, This passage that we're going to read today is actually the passage that's going to drive our entire Christmas series. We're going to be looking at just this one text, this one verse throughout this series, and we're going to spend each week breaking down this this verse and uh, discovering the meaning of this verse. And so today we're going to read it for the first time in this series. If you're able, would you all join me in standing as we honor the reading of God's word today. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to be reading here from verse 6. This is our, our text for our entire series. Let's read it together. It says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. So this is speaking, of course, of the Christ, the Messiah, who is yet to be born, the Son of God, the one and only Son of God, the Savior of the world, who is not yet born. He goes on to say this, Isaiah says, and he will be called, what's it say, everybody help me out, he will be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Before you take your seats today, would you do this for me? High five five people and tell them God speaks to me. Would you do that for me? High five five people, tell them God speaks to me. So this passage that we just read uh, was written, speaking of the Messiah who was not yet born, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and uh, this was actually written 700 years before Christ was born. And Isaiah writes to us, and he says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And notice that Isaiah does not say these will be his names. He says this is what he will be called. In other words, this is what he will be known for. This is what he will be famous for. This is what people will say about him. And isn't it amazing to think that 2,000 years later, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is what he is known for. That every single week we sing songs in our churches declaring that he is our wonderful counselor our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. And today, I have the distinct privilege of just focusing on that first attribute, that Christ is our wonderful counselor. So what does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus to be our wonderful counselor? Well, it means that the best counsel you could ever receive is from the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that whoever you are, in whatever circumstances you face, whatever situation you find yourself in, his counsel is the best counsel, and it has no equal. This means that you have to start asking this question right here. Do you ask God what you should do as much as you ask people what you should do? Do you ask God what you should do as much as you ask people what you should do? Let me put it like this. See, if you were to, if you were to gather the top 25 most wisest, most godliest people on this earth, and you were to ask their advice and combine all that wisdom together, and yet you never dropped to your knees and sought the king of kings, you have failed to seek wise counsel. For he and he alone is the wonderful counselor. Now, someone might begin to to argue, and you might think, well, seeking out a wise, godly person, isn't that the same as seeking out counsel from God himself? And I would say that even the best man is a man at best. See, to put all your hope and all your trust and all of your emphasis on just one person or even several people is a mistake. You want to know why? Because they're people, and people aren't perfect. And 
If you still disagree with me, I would say wait and read this verse because truly your argument is not with me. It is with God and with Scripture because Scripture says this in James chapter 1, verse 5. It says, if any of you, anybody listening, if any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask who? Who? God. Not Oprah. Not Dr. Phil. Not Ellen DeGeneres or Judge Judy or Greg Laurie or Rick Warren. It says, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault in the things you do wrong. He gives generously to all without finding fault. And listen to this promise. And it will be given to you. If you would just seek wisdom, counsel from the wonderful counselor, it will be given given to you. This is this amazing promise. And, and if you were to ask me, and it's just me, I'm just one person, but it seems like seeking counsel from him is pretty important. Maybe even more important than seeking counsel from people. Now don't misunderstand me, okay? Uh, I'm not saying don't ever ask advice from people. I'm not saying don't listen to people. I seek advice all the time when making decisions. So I'm not saying that. Here's what I am saying. Don't do one without the other. Don't go talk to people and tell yourself you talk to God because it's not the same thing. In fact, I would tell you that if you want to go talk to people and ask them for counsel, you must first ask God for wisdom so that when they give you advice, you know whether you heard from man or God. And I think a mistake we often make is to think that just because a person is godly, everything comes out of their mouth is from God. And that's not true. See, there's only one wonderful counselor. There's only one who is without error. And it's not the person that you always like to go to. Now, I understand this can get complicated, right? Because seeking counsel from Jesus Christ is not as simple as you just walking up to him, right? Right? Wouldn't that be so nice, though? Like, if you didn't know what to do, some of you are facing a situation right now, and it's complicated, you have no idea what you should do. Wouldn't it be better if you could just walk up and just say, hey, Jesus, just tell me what to do? Wouldn't that just be so much easier, so much better? You know what's crazy to me? Jesus actually tells us the exact opposite of that. Jesus disagrees with us, when we say it would be so much simpler if you just stood here and told us what to do. He disagrees with that. In fact, listen to this. In John chapter 16, verse 5, this is what Jesus says. He's speaking to his disciples. This is his last moment he had with, him before he, before the, with them before he was arrested and crucified. And listen to what he says. He says, but now I'm going to him who sent me. Speaking of his death and resurrection and ascending to be with the Father. He says, but none of you ask me. Where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. Listen to this. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus speaks of this advocate, but, but who is he? Who is this advocate? Well, the English word in our Bibles that says advocate, or yours might say helper or counselor, that English word is translated from a Greek word that I can't pronounce, but literally translated, this is what that Greek word means. Because if you didn't know, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And so originally there was a Greek word there, and that Greek word literally translated means this. One called alongside to help. Now, it could mean several things. It could mean a helper, a comforter, an exhorter, intercessor, encourager, advocate, I ran out of fingers, or, or what's that say? Or counselor. So Jesus says, I'm going to leave this earth, but don't worry, because I'm sending someone to help you. I'm sending to you a counselor. Someone, Jesus says, will help them, counsel them, encourage them, exhort them, comfort them. Someone who he says will never, ever leave them. So who is this advocate? Who is this counselor? Well, Jesus says this. He goes on further. In John chapter 16, verse 13, he says, 
But when he, the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, as we know him as, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So what in the world is Jesus talking about here? Well, Jesus is explaining to his disciples that things are about to change. Jesus says, hey, I'm leaving this earth but I'm gonna send someone to help you. Someone he calls the counselor, the advocate, the spirit of truth who is the Holy Spirit. So what's changing? Well, Jesus describes in detail in John chapters 14 through 16, this change is about to happen. Here's what he says, that his physical presence is leaving this earth to be replaced by something better. You can go read it if you want, but basically here's a summary of what Jesus says. He says, right now, The entire world has access to God, but it is limited access. He says, you have to be with me in order to be with the Father. That is limited access, and I can only be in one place at one time. But he says, if I leave, you will go from limited access to God to continual communion with him. And then he goes on to say, right now, you receive teaching from me by my physical presence speaking directly to your ears. But pretty soon, I will not be physically present speaking directly to your ears. I will be living inside of you, bypassing your ears and speaking directly to your heart. You see, Jesus left this earth taking away his physical presence limited presence in order that he might send the spirit and he might give us unlimited access to his presence and live inside of us so that he will never, ever leave us. You see, today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have access to Jesus Christ 365 days of the year with wisdom and counsel available at every second of every day through the power and working of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says he doesn't tell you his own words. He tells you the words I give him to tell you. You see, Jesus is our wonderful counselor at every moment of every day through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And right about now, you might be wondering, if this is all true, why doesn't God speak to me. You might say, you know, Chris, I I believe you. You know, I'm a Christian, and I I believe that that when we believe in Jesus, that God sends his spirit, and he invades our hearts, and he helps us, and guides us, and speaks to us, and comforts us, and all these things. But I don't understand why I don't ever feel like God speaks to me and does those things. And I spent a lot of time thinking and praying about this whole idea of the voice of God, and I have found that how well you hear and understand God's voice depends on how you answer these two questions. The first one, if you're taking notes, is how often do you seek God? How often do you seek God? What I mean by that is how often do you pray? Do you pray sometimes? Do you pray when you have to? Do you pray when you're desperate? Do you pray just as you lead your small group or when someone calls on you and then publicly you pray, but other than that, that's it. When you're angry, do you you pray and ask God to help you, to give you self-control and stop you from saying something he doesn't want you to say? Or how about when people come to you for advice? Do you speak out of your own wisdom or do you stop and ask God in your mind, God, give me wisdom to help this person? How often do you seek God? The second question is this. How often do you obey God? How often do you obey God when he speaks to you? You know what I think? I think we often don't involve God in our lives, in our day-to-day lives, and then we wonder why he never speaks to us. And then all of a sudden, he'll, he'll want us to do something really important, and 
and, and he'll speak to us. And you know what we do? We start arguing. Well, well, you know what? Maybe that's not God. And then we don't obey him. And then we wonder why he doesn't speak to us. You know what I found? I found that the more I seek God and the more I ask him to speak to me, the more he speaks to me. And the more that I listen to him and obey him, the more he speaks to me and the more important things he says to do. See, I think the reason why many of us don't feel like God speaks to us is because we're not quiet long enough to hear him speak. And then when he does speak, we often find a way not to listen to that voice. And so if you asked that question a moment ago, why doesn't God speak to me? This is what I would say to you. If you, if you feel like God isn't speaking lately, go back to the last thing he told you to do and ask yourself, did I do it? Feel like God's not speaking lately, go back to the last thing you think he told you to do and ask yourself, did you do it? You see, because when we're not listening to God when he's speaking, it's only a matter of time before he stops speaking. Earlier I shared a story from six years ago um, when I heard God speak to me, but I want to end our time together by sharing a more recent time that God spoke to me. Uh, more recently, in 2017, you all might remember uh, Andrew Steckline from Inland Hills. Andrew Steckline from Inland Hills, the picture that I put on the thing. It's the picture. There it is. <laughs> you might remember him. Um, you might even have gone to Inland Hills Church. You might have heard of this. It made... Uh, national news. I remember when I heard about Andrew Steckline uh, taking his own life, it, it broke my heart. As a pastor, I didn't know him, but as a pastor who has several times struggled with depression and dark moments, um, it just broke my heart. I remember thinking like, I wish I knew him. I wish I could have been there for him. I wish he could have known that he wasn't alone. I started praying and I, was, I started wondering like, God, is there anything I can do to help? I'll never forget in November 2017, God revealed to me very clearly what he wanted me to do. I talked to my wife, we prayed about it and we agreed that God was moving in our hearts to give his surviving wife and children $1,000. I was very clear, very clear about what he wanted us to do. I came back to my wife about a week later, and I said, you know, I've been thinking, it's, it's, it's December, uh, we're headed into Christmas time, it's just not a good time, so honey, I was thinking, let's wait until after Christmas, and, and, and next year, we'll, we'll, we'll give them that money. About a month later or so, I, I ran into a friend, and he knew Andrew, and he knew the family, and I asked him, hey, what do they need? And he said, uh, have you given financially to them? And I said, no, but, but I want to. We're going to. In fact, my wife and I are going to. And he said, yeah, that, that's what they need right now. They really need financial help. And I said, okay. And it was like God very clearly said, hey, remember when I spoke to you? You, you need to do that now. And I told my wife, okay. I said, honey, finances are tight next month. Next month, we'll do it. Well, one month turned into two months. Two months turned into three months, and I'm very ashamed to tell you that I never gave a dime to help that family. And you could say that I had $20 obedience, but I did not have $1,000 obedience. You could say that I try to trust God when it hurts a little, but I struggle to trust God when it means that I have to trust in him with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. And some of might argue, well, you know, hey, big deal. I'm sure God provided for the Steckline family. 
And I would say, did God provide for the Steckline family? Absolutely he did. Does God need me in order for his will to be done on this earth? Absolutely not. In fact, to be clear, if you do not obey God, he will find someone who will. But there's this statement Jesus once made that bothers me. Jesus once said this. If you love me, you will obey me. And I think you can reword that statement to say, it bothers God's children when they don't obey him. Many of you know this, but for those of you who don't, this is uh, my last time preaching the word to you all at this church. In case you haven't heard, uh, we announced this a little while ago, but Vantage Point is sending me off in January to start a new church in Long Beach, California. So this is the last time that I get to preach the word, uh, at least as a staff member at Vantage Point. I don't know if they're gonna ever invite me back. I've caused a lot of trouble here, but uh, it is at least the last time as a staff member. The last time that I spoke, I got to share with you all um, how excited I am for this church God is calling me to plant. But what I didn't get a chance to share with you, they only give me 30 minutes and I always break it anyways. I couldn't, I couldn't talk anymore, but I wanted to say for this time um, to tell you how hard it's been for me. I love this church so much. Sorry, I really tried to <clears throat> not get emotional, but I love this church with, with all my heart. And, um, you know, it took God a couple of years to get my heart ready to let go of Vantage Point. Because I love you, and I love this church so much. I grew up here. Some of you heard me preach when I was a horrible preacher, and I'd, I'd go really long and I wouldn't make any sense. And, and uh, you've allowed me to speak into your lives and I, I can't tell you how much it's been an honor and a privilege. And um, to say a couple things that are personal to me, um, Pastor Tom, who is somewhere, um, I wanna say to you that thank you so much for believing in me, for encouraging me, I don't know where you are, but I've come to respect you so much and appreciate you so much, and I hope that I make you proud in this next endeavor. Pastor Mark, um, there has not been a pastor that has had a greater impact in my life than you. Your leadership, encouragement, your generosity has forever changed who I am, and I am forever grateful. And to the rest of you, um, thank you for trusting me to speak the word into your life. Thank you for all the encouraging words over the years. Thank you for the best 10 years of my life. I won't forget you guys. And even if they don't invite me back to speak, I'll still show up every once in a while just to tell you how much I miss you guys. Would you pray with me? Father, God, I'm so privileged to serve this church for the past 10 years. Um, God, I'm so grateful for the call you placed on my life. I did not deserve it, but this is what you called me to. And um, Father, I want to pray <clears throat> for every person in this room that you have spoken to. God, there may even be someone who feels like they had never heard your voice before, but they did today. God, I pray for every person that you have moved and you have spoken to. And I pray that you would show them what it looks like 
to walk with you from this place. God, I pray that you would finish the work you have begun. For we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Let's give uh, Chris a huge round of applause, can't we? I know this... I know this seems like a sad day, but it's actually a really happy day, not because we get to get rid of you, Chris, but it's because our church is having a baby, you know, and whenever there's a baby that's being born, you know, it's always a happy day. Chris, you're still going to be around, you know, I'm going to be around, renovate, you know, I'm going to hopefully be, I don't know, one of your first guest speakers or something like that, and, 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 and <laughs> yeah, that's presuming a lot, isn't it? But here, here, here's what I think, wow, this is the beginning of a movement, you know? Like, what if it could all start with this? And what if, you know, one day, kind of like we've talked about, what if one day we could look up and see just an orchard of trees that we've planted together as all of the different leaders and pastors just kind of stand up on a platform together and see what it is that we've done together because together we can do something that we cannot do alone. And so one of the things that I want to say is that 12 years ago, our church was planted in the same way. Our, our church... Um, there was another church in Diamond Bar, and that pastor wanted to give away uh, staff members, me and Tom, in order to make this church happen. And what I've realized is that what that pastor wanted to do is that pastor built a platform, not just so that he could stand on that platform, not just so that he could have a place to do ministry from or so that he could preach from, not just it was a platform where he could be the hero, but ultimately 12 years ago, he built that platform so that me and Tom could stand on that platform that he built. And so that we could ultimately, so that he could make a hero out of us, not himself, so that we could go further than we would have been able to go otherwise just by ourselves. And so Chris, we have the privilege of being able to do that for you today. We built this platform for you, not for us. So that, you know, that this isn't just about, this isn't just about us being able to do ministry. This is about us having you the opportunity to stand on all of our shoulders so that you would be able to go further than you would be able to go on your own and that we would even be able to reach a whole group of other people that we wouldn't be able to reach all the way in Long Beach on our own. And so here's what I think, just to end out with one verse. Uh, Jesus is right about to go to the cross and he makes an audacious statement, a crazy statement. When he says this in John chapter 14, verse 12, he's talking to the disciples right before he's going to be crucified. And he says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, and he will do even greater things than these. So Jesus is looking at his disciples, and he's saying, you know what, guys? Like, I'm going to do some pretty cool things, but let me tell you he's going to do greater things than me. You guys. And Jesus was ultimately saying, you know what, guys? As much as I want to be the hero, here's what I want to do even more. I want you guys to be the hero. I want to make a hero out of you guys. And that's what we have the opportunity to do, do with you, Chris. We want you to be the hero. We want you to be able to go out to Long Beach and not only save a whole bunch of people in Jesus' name, but what we want you to do is we want you to continue the legacy that was started for you, that you would build a platform so that other people might be able to stand on it. So here's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you if this is okay to humble yourself before the Lord. Get down. Get down on your knees, boy as we all lay our hands on you. And let's all, why don't you stretch your hand out towards Chris and we're all gonna commission him right now. Father, this is what your word says, to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything you have commanded us. Father, your word does not tell the lost to come to church. Your word tells us to go to the lost. And that is what we are doing. We are sending Chris out to the lost that we would never, ever be able to reach on our own. And Father, we are asking that the name of Jesus Christ, not the name of Vantage Point, not the name of Renovate, not the name of any other human organization. Father, we are asking that the banner of Jesus Christ be lifted up high and exalted in the Inland Empire, in Southern California, all throughout this nation and all throughout this world so that 
Lord, that your name might be glorified. That's what we truly pray for. So we pray for this daughter church of ours. As this daughter church is about to be born, Father, that your glory, that your presence, that your power would go out with Chris and his family and his team, that they would be strong um, because, Lord, this is what we know. If the wonderful counselor is behind us, then who can be against us, Father? So we ask, Father, for your hand to be upon Chris, for your anointing, for your strength, for your power, Lord God, to be on him. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen.